Hello, everyone. Welcome to the INE Express course series. In this presentation, I will talk about how futures trading works at INE. We will answer this question in five parts. Part one focuses on the characteristics of on exchange trading and OTC trading and the market structure of INE. Part two explains how investors can access the INE market and what eligibility requirements they need to meet. Part three highlights some of the key aspects of trading at INE, including trading hours, available orders, how various prices are formed, and major trading parameters. Part four explains the last trading day and the position limit for the futures contracts listed on INE. Lastly, part five goes over the rules on hedging and arbitrage trading. So in part one, we will look at the differences between on-exchange trading and off-exchange or OTC trading, the reasons for choosing to trade at an exchange, and INE's market structure. First, an OTC market is very different from an exchange-traded market in how they operate. In general, OTC derivatives are directly traded between the buyer and the seller without the participation of an exchange or intermediary. For this reason, the terms of the contracts are freely negotiable and thus more flexible, but each party is also exposed to counterparty risks. In contrast, exchange-traded derivatives are standardized contracts in terms of expiration date, contract size, etc., and are centrally traded, cleared, and settled through the exchange. As a central counterparty, the exchange interposes into every trade functioning as the buyer to every seller and the seller to every buyer, and provides performance guarantee for transactions in futures and other derivatives. OTC and exchange traded markets each have their advantages and drawbacks, and neither dominates the other. But regulatory reforms are now leaning towards centralized clearing because CCPs reduce systematic risks, market manipulation, and fraud as well as help maintain the overall stability of the market. Moreover, prices on an exchange are more transparent and accessible to a wide range of market participants. The Shanghai International Energy Exchange was recognized as a qualifying center counterparty in early 2019. Since then, INE has been performing its QCCP duties in domestic and foreign futures markets and financial derivative markets in accordance with international standards. The futures market is an exchange traded market where all trading orders are centrally matched. But this does not mean that everyone has to visit an exchange to trade. This is because futures exchanges implement a membership system so that only members can trade on the floor. Of course, Chinese exchanges have been offering electronic trading right from the beginning so even members don't have to trade in person. In a futures market, a client sends trading orders to his carrying member, usually a futures firm, who then forwards it to the exchange for central matching. In other words, the exchange only accepts trading orders from members and only settles transactions with members. And clients participate in futures trading, clearing, and delivery solely through their carrying members. This creates a three-tier structure consisting of the exchange, members, or other intermediaries, and clients. In this setup, the exchange monitors the risks of its members, and each member monitors the risks of its clients. As shown in this diagram, INE is the CCP. Domestic members and overseas special participants trade directly at exchange, and domestic and overseas clients execute trades through a domestic or overseas broker, or for overseas clients only, an overseas intermediary. Other than trading participants, designated depository banks provide futures margin custody and transfer services. Designated delivery storage facilities offer physical delivery and storage services. And market data vendors deliver efficient and expedient market data services which also makes the price information at INE more transparent and accessible. So far, we have looked at the major components of INE's market structure. We will talk about members and clients in greater details in a later section. 
In part two, we will answer the following questions. How to trade at INE, in particular as an overseas client? What are the differences between various account opening institutions, such as members, overseas special participants, and overseas intermediaries? How to apply for a trading code? What eligibility requirements do clients need to meet? And what are the steps to open an account? Domestic clients can trade through domestic futures firm members. Overseas clients have four options. First, they can trade through an FF member, just like do domestic clients. Second, they can trade through an overseas special brokerage participant, or OSBP. Third, they can open an account with an overseas intermediary, who in turn will work with an FF member. And fourth, they can open an account with an overseas intermediary who then engages an OSBP. Non-FF members can trade directly at INE. This is also true for overseas special non-brokerage participants, or OSNBP. Please note that FF members can directly participate in trading, clearing, and delivery procedures, while OSPs are limited to trading only. For clearing and delivery, they need to work with an FF member. Let's look at this in more details in the next slide. As this table shows, only domestic members can directly execute and clear trades at INE. For OSPs, direct trading is available, but not direct clearing, which must be done through a domestic FF member. Lastly, neither direct trading nor direct clearing is open to overseas intermediaries. As mentioned in the last slide, Overseas intermediaries work directly with overseas clients to open accounts and to route their orders to FF members. As an example, I will now explain how an overseas client opens an account through an overseas intermediary. First, the overseas client prepares the account opening materials. The overseas intermediary reviews them and keeps the documents on record and then submits an account opening application on behalf of the client. Then the China Futures Market Monitoring Center, or CFMMC, tracks the application for completeness. After a domestic FF member, or OSBP, approves the account opening application, CFMMC will forward the client's materials to INE. Then INE tracks the consistency of account opening information, opens the account, and assigns a trading code to the client. The client now has obtained the trading code. This marks the end of the account opening process. There are some other rules about the trading code. We'll look at them next. INE implements the trading code system as required by its general exchange rules and the trading rules. Account opening institutions are not permitted to aggregate or net multi-client positions. Then what is the trading code system? At INE, trading codes are classified into trading codes for non-FF members, for OSNBPs, and for clients. We will focus on the client's trading codes. A client trading code is a 12-digit number. The first four digits are the member's ID code, and the remaining eight are the client's ID code. One client can open accounts through multiple FF members, OSBPs, or overseas intermediaries, whom are collectively referred to as account opening institutions. Once again, account opening institutions may not aggregate or net multi-client positions. In particular, although a client has many ways to open an account, it may choose only one for each FF member that ultimately carries its account. You may be wondering what circumstance is a violation of this one account opening method rule. Here is an example. An overseas client wants to open an account through FF member A and another account through an overseas intermediary, but also requests the overseas intermediary to route orders through FF member A. Because these two methods will produce the same trading code, the client is not allowed to choose both. Here is another example. An overseas client wants to open accounts through overseas intermediaries C and D, but also hopes both intermediaries 
will route the orders through the same FF member A. This also breaks the rule that trading codes must be unique and is thus not permitted. In short, in both scenarios, the rule that a client can choose only one account opening method through a given FF member is bridged. Here is another rule. An overseas intermediary can engage multiple FF members but can't carry the same client through more than one FF member. This means that after an overseas client opens an account, the overseas intermediary can route the client's orders through FF member A or FF member B, but not both at the same time. In terms of trader eligibility, account opening institutions are required to assess a client on his futures trading knowledge and risk tolerance so that they can provide appropriate products to suitable clients. You can refer to the INE Futures Trading Participant Eligibility Management Rules for more details. To trade at INE, both individual clients and institutional clients must meet certain criteria, which I call four haves and one have not. First, individual clients and the business personnel of institutional clients must know the basics of futures trading, understanding the trading rules and pass the knowledge test. Second, they must possess the trading experience listed in the table, which means having record of no less than 20 simulated futures or options transactions from at least 10 days of trading at a Chinese trading venue, or no less than 10 transactions in futures, options, or other centrally cleared derivatives at a Chinese trading venue in the past three years, or no less than 10 recognized overseas transactions in the past three years. Third, they must have sufficient amount of available funds. Specifically, a client can maintain a minimum balance of RMB 100,000 or its equivalents in foreign currency in each of its margin accounts on the five consecutive trading days before applying for a trading code or trading access. To trade crude oil futures, this requirement is raised to 500,000 yuan for an individual and uh, 1 million yuan for an institution. Fourth, an institutional client must have sound internal control, risk management, and other necessary frameworks for managing futures trading. An individual client must have full civil capacity. So these are the four halves. One half not refers to that a client must not be prohibited or restricted to trade futures or options. Specifically, a client should have no material adverse credibility records, have not been banned from the futures market by a competent regulator, and are not restricted in or prohibited from futures trading by any laws, regulations, rules, or INE rules. Now we will go a little bit deeper into INE's eligibility rules. Apart from the basic knowledge requirements I have mentioned earlier, individual clients and authorized traders of institutional clients must pass the online knowledge test administered by the China Futures Association. For overseas clients, they may certify that they have the appropriate level of knowledge by signing a statement to that effect. When it comes to available funds, the account opening institution needs to verify whether a client satisfies INE's funds management requirement on the five trading days before the date of application. The available funds can be in RMB or other accepted foreign currencies. Clients permitted to trade other specified domestic products may be exempt from certain requirements such as basic knowledge, trading experience, and available funds. Professional investors, special institutional clients, clients that have 50 trading days of transaction record in a year, and market makers may also be exempt from the requirements we mentioned earlier. Now let's move on to part three. In the following slides, we will talk about trading hours, types of trading orders and prices, how these prices are determined, how margin is collected, and a price limit with features unique to the Chinese market. We will start with the trading hours. Daytime trading hours are identical to those of the other commodity futures exchanges in China, starting at 9 a.m. Beijing time 
and ends at 11.30 a.m. with a 15-minute recess between 10.15 and 10.30. The afternoon session runs from 1.30 to 3 p.m. Nighttime trading starts from 9 p.m. on the previous trading day to 2.30 a.m. But for TSR20 and low sulfur fuel oil futures, it is 9 to 11 p.m. From 8.55 to 9 p.m. is the central auction session. In this five-minute window, bids and asks are entered into the central order book in the first four minutes and matched during the last minute. If the night trading session is not held due to public holidays or other special circumstances, central auction is moved to 8.55 to 9 a.m. in the daytime trading hours. Trading orders supported by INE include limit orders, order cancellation, FOK, and FAK. FOK, short for few or queue, indicates an order with a specified price that is automatically cancelled if not filled in its entirety. An FOK order is thus either filled in whole or cancelled in whole. FAK, short for few and queue, indicates an order with a specified price that if partially filled, the unfilled portion of which is automatically cancelled. Once an FAK order is filled in part, its unfilled portion is automatically cancelled. An order can be anywhere between one lot and 500 lots. This slide explains how the open price, trading price, settlement price, and final settlement price are determined. Open price at INE is produced by the five-minute central auction before market open. During the central auction, bids and asks are entered into the central order book during the first four minutes and matched during the last minute. Matching is done by finding a price that maximizes the trading volume during the central auction. This price is called the open price. If the central auction is not able to produce an open price for a contract, the price of the first trade executed following the central auction section is the open price. During the continuous auction, INE's trading system automatically matches bids and asks by price time priority. The new trading price is the middle price among the bid price, the ask price, and the price of the previous trade executed. The daily settlement price for a futures contract that has been bought or sold on a given day is the volume weighted average price of all trades in that contract executed on that day. If no trade was executed, then the settlement price will be determined according to other rules. Please refer to clearing related rules for details. Lastly, about the final settlement price. For crude oil or low sulfur fuel oil futures contract, the final settlement price is the arithmetic mean of the settlement prices of the contract during the last five trading days on which at least one trade in the contract has been executed. For a TSR20 futures contract, it is the volume weighted average price of the contract during the last five trading days on which at least one trade in the contract has been executed. The trading margin for TSR20 crude oil and low sulfur fuel oil futures at this moment is 8% 12% and 12% of the contract value, respectively. The price limit is 6%, 10%, and 10%. As a contract approaches the delivery month, its minimum trading margin increases accordingly. Using TSR20 futures as an example, the required trading margin is 8% starting from the listing date, 10% starting from the 10th trading day of the second month before the delivery month. 15% starting from the 10th trading day of the month before the delivery month. And finally, 20% starting from the second trading day prior to the last trading day. This stepwise increase of margin rate also applies to crude oil and low sulfur fuel oil contracts. Adjustments to the trading margin and price limit can be viewed by navigating to INE homepage, Circular and News, Circular. The prevailing trading margin and price limit can be accessed through INE homepage guideline market data. You may ask how much margin is needed to buy one contract. 
Let's take crude oil as an example. Each crude oil futures contract corresponds to 1,000 barrels. Assuming the price per barrel is 360 yuan, and the margin rate is 12 percent, then each lot of crude oil futures requires RMB 43,200 yuan of trading margin. We will now talk about price limit, which defines the maximum and minimum price permitted for a contract on a single day. Quotes within the price limit are valid quotes. Those outside the range will be rejected. In INE rules, there is a concept called limit lock the market. If we say limit up lock the market, it means that within the five minutes before market close, there are only bids but no asks at the limit price or any asks are instantly executed at the limit price. And the latest trading price is the same as the limit price. Similarly, a particular contract is set to be in a limit down locked market on a particular trading day if within the five minutes before market close. There are only asks but no bids at the limit price. So any bids are instantly executed at the limit price and the latest trading price is the same as the limit price. Does the limit locked market affect the price limit and minimum trading margin of a contract on the next day? The answer is yes. In fact, both will be adjusted accordingly. This slide shows how that adjustment works. We again use crude oil as an example. Assuming the current price limit of 10%, if a limit locked market occurs on day one, the price limit on day two will be 10% plus 3%, equaling 13%. And the trading margin to be collected during end of day settlement on day one will be 13% plus 2%, equaling 15%. If another limit locked market occurs on day two and is in the same direction as on day one, the price limit on day three will be 10% plus 5%, equaling 15% and the trading margin to be collected during end of day settlement on day two will be 15% plus 2% equaling 17%. Part four explains the rules on last trading day and position limit and the consequences of failing to reduce open positions to within the position limit in time. Okay, here are some of the things you need to know about the last trading day and position limit. The last trading day of a crude oil or a low sulfur fuel oil futures contract is the last day of trading of the month before the delivery month. IME may address this date according to its rules. If the date is adjusted, it may affect the timing for the listing of new contracts, exit of individual clients, hedging and arbitrage procedures and EFPs. Take the 2106 contract as an example. Year 21 represents the year 2021, and 06 the month of June. So 2106 means the contract with the delivery month of June 2021. Thus, the last trading day is May 31st, 2021. Individuals must exit from their positions by the eighth trading day before the last trading day. For a 2106 futures contract of crude oil or low sulfur fuel oil, eight trading days before May 31st is May 19th. Therefore, positions held by an individual must be closed in full by May 19th. The last trading day of a TSR20 futures contract is the 15th day of the delivery month, which will be postponed accordingly if it falls on a public holiday or rest day. Other than this, the last trading day rules for TSR20 are identical to those for crude oil and low sulfur fuel oil. Let's look at one more example. An NR2106 contract is deliverable in June 2021 with the last trading day of June 15th. Eight trading days ahead is June the 3rd, by which date all individuals must close out their positions in this contract. Next, let's look at position limit, which is time dependent. This means that as a contract approaches its delivery month, there will be ever more stringent requirement on holding a position. Assume we have a crude oil futures contract with an open interest greater than 75,000 rods. Between the listing date and the month 
before the delivery month, FF members, overseas special participants, and overseas intermediaries are subject to a percentage-based position limit of 25% of the size of the open interest. For non-FF members, OSNBPs, and clients, the position limit is a fixed 3,000 lots from the listing date to the last day of trading of the third month before the delivery month. 1,500 lots throughout the second month before the delivery month, and 500 lots until the last day of trading of the month before the delivery month. As we can see, the closer we are to the delivery month, the lower the position limit will be. For low sulfur fuel oil futures, position limit in the second month and the last month before the delivery month is the same as with crude oil futures. But from the listing date to the last day of trading of the third month before the delivery month, the position limit varies according to the size of the open interest. Specifically, the position limit is a fixed 10,000 lots if the open interest is less than 100,000 lots and 10% of the open interest otherwise. It's essentially the same setup for TSR20 futures. FF members, overseas special participants, and overseas intermediaries are limited to 25% of the open interest at first, and then the limit successively reduces to 2,600 and 200 lots as the delivery month comes closer. Information about position limit and more can be found in the INE risk management rules accessible from INE homepage, rules and regulations, and rule book. There are a number of circumstances that will prompt INE to carry out forced liquidation. They include, first, the clearing deposit balance of a member recorded on any of the internal ledgers at INE, either for its own clients or for whom it clears trades, falls below zero, and the member is not able to meet the margin requirement within the specified time limit. Second, the open positions of a non-FF member, OSNBP or client, have exceeded the applicable position limit. Third, a non-FF member, OSNBP or client fails to run the positions held in the futures contract to multiples of a certain value as required within the specified time limit, or is not qualified to conduct a delivery for expiring contracts in its position. Fourth, a violation of INE rules that warrants the false liquidation. Fifth, any emergency that warrants the false liquidation. Or sixth, any other circumstance that makes the false liquidation necessary. If the position limit is exceeded, a client can still voluntarily close its positions in the first trading session on the next day. But access positions after this session are subject to false liquidation by INE. The specific procedures are, if a client's open positions are over the position limit at the end of the previous trading day, the client's carry member will receive a false liquidation notice in the member service system. In this case, the member, relevant overseas special participant, or the client should voluntarily liquidate the positions until they are within the position limit. The outcome of this liquidation will be checked by INE. If access position remains after the specified time limit, INE will directly force liquidate the remaining access for some clients, especially those with hedging and arbitrage needs, the general position limit may not be high enough. These clients can in fact apply for a hedging or arbitrage quota. Part five would explain how to apply for hedging and arbitrage quotas and how to use them. We will begin with the relevant timetable, then we will look at how to apply for and use the quotas and what things one should look out for. First of all, INE approval is required for hedging and arbitrage quotas. To obtain a hedging quota, clients should submit applications to their account opening institutions who will review them and complete the subsequent procedures with INE. Non-FF members and OSNBPs should directly apply to INE. So what materials are needed to apply for a hedging quota? 
first of all, photocopy of business license, certificate of incorporation, or other documents of similar nature. Second, overview on business performance in fiscal commodities in the previous year, or the latest audited annual financial report. Third, the business plan for physical commodities for the current year or the following year, and any purchase and sale contracts or other valid documentations commensurate with the hedging quota being sought. Fourth, the hedging plan. Fifth, hedging management rules if the applicant is a non-FF member or an OSMBP, and six, other materials required by IME. Before we talk about the timetables, let's take a quick detour to look at the classification of trading positions. Positions in IME products are classified into positions for regular month and positions for nearby delivery month. For products such as crude oil and low sulfur fuel oil futures that expire at the end of a month, regular month refers to the period from the listing day to the last trading day of the third month before the delivery month. Nearby delivery month refers to the two months before the delivery month. For instance, SC2106 is due for delivery in early June and will expire at the end of May. Therefore, until the end of March, positions in the contract are positions for regular month. But once we enter April, they will become positions for nearby delivery month. For products such as TSR20 that expire in the middle of the month, the regular month are the period from listing day to the last trading day of the second month before the delivery month. The nearby delivery month are the month before the delivery month and the delivery month itself. Take NR2106, for example. Before the end of April, positions in NR2106 are positions for regular month. As we enter May, they will become positions for nearby delivery month until delivery, which starts after June 15th. For crude oil and low sulfur fuel oil features, the application for hedging quota for regular month should be submitted between the listing day of the relevant contract and the last trading day of the third month before the delivery month. Late applications will not be accepted. For example, for SC2106, the application can be submitted between the listing date June 1, 2018 and March 2021. Hedging quota for regular month is usable right from the date of quota approval. If no application for hedging quota for nearby delivery month is submitted, then upon entering those months, INE will automatically convert the quota for regular month into quota for nearby delivery month. The size of this quota is the lesser of the approved hedging quota for regular month and the general position limit for that product in nearby delivery month. The application for hedging quota for nearby delivery month should be submitted between the first trading day of the fourth month before the delivery month and the last trading day of the second month before the delivery month. Again, no late applications are accepted. This means that for SC2106, the application can be submitted on any day between February the 1st and April the 30th. After obtaining a hedging quota, a non-FF member, OSMBP, or client may use it on the relevant contract before market close on the third trading day before the last trading day. If no position is that is established with the quota by this date, the quota is treated as for fate for the SC2106 contract. Hedging positions can be established from April to May 26 but not thereafter, as we would be entering the last three trading days before the delivery month. Hedge quota for regular month may be used repeatedly in regular month, and that for nearby delivery month may also be used in the same manner in the second month before the delivery month, but not so starting from the first trading day of the month before the delivery month. What does repeated use mean? It means that a client may close its positions and then open new ones with the same quota, as long as its total positions do not exceed the quota size. For example, if a client has an approved quota of 1,000 lots, it may close 1,000 lots and then open 1,000 lots. 
as long as the total hedging positions do not exceed 1,000 lots. By contrast, non-repeated use means that if the quota is 1,000 lots, once the client closes out 1,000 lots, it may not open another 1,000 lots. What materials are needed to apply for arbitrage quotas? Arbitrage quotas for regular months is usable on all futures contracts of the approved product in regular months, but is not automatically converted into arbitrage quota for nearby delivery months. To apply for arbitrage quota for regular months, the applicant needs to submit the following materials. First, arbitrage trading strategies. Second, proof of the amount of available funds. Settlement statements are generally sufficient. And third, other materials required by IME. When applying for arbitrage quota for nearby delivery month, a price deviation analysis for the contracts relevant to the application is also required. As stated earlier, the arbitrage quota for regular month is usable on all futures contracts of the approved product in regular month, but is not automatically converted into arbitrage quota for nearby delivery month. For a crude oil futures contract, the application for arbitrage quota for nearby delivery month should be submitted between the first trading day of the fourth month before the delivery month and the last trading day of the second month before the delivery month. No late applications are accepted. Like the general position limit, arbitrage quota can be used repeatedly. Low sulfur fuel oil and TSR20 futures contracts have a different application window. For details, please refer to the INE trading rules available under the Rules and Regulations section on the INE official website. All right, that will be all for today on trading at INE. I hope you'll find this presentation informative. Thank you very much for listening.